mute mode when they're not speaking for uh, usual reasons. Uh, I'll just go through the agenda. Uh, apologies, there aren't any. Uh, remind members to declare any relevant financial other interests at each committee meeting as applicable. Jim, your bill. Give the bill, yeah. 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 Uh, draft minutes of proceedings of the 27th of May 2020. Draft minutes of the meeting are on page five. Members, are we content with the draft minutes or an accurate record of proceedings? Agreed. Agreed. And if agreed, the minutes will be published on the website. Agreed. <clears throat> okay, matters arising. Uh, the National Crime Agency. Uh, for members at page 11, the National Crime Agency has responded in relation to the committee attending its office in Belfast for a briefing. However, due to social distancing requirements, there's capacity for only three persons. So that obviously means their office is only 18 feet wide. Um, I thought it was four. Huh? No. Sorry, I, I had only looked at it last week. It came in during the meeting. So when I when I looked at it, I thought it was four, but it, it's three. Yeah. So um, members, do we have any comments on this? Do we wish to go ahead with this meeting with myself and two other members nominated from the or myself with the clerk and one other member nominated from the committee, or do we wish to delay it until the social distancing is either reduced or we can get to that point? I'm open to any particular views. Well, uh, I'd propose just that we would wait, or that possibly maybe it could be facilitated through Zoom, so that all members could attend. You know. Particularly those of us who were on the committee previous when this was being dealt with, which is three or four of us. Um, If we had a meeting with the three, it can't be relayed? No, it can't because of the security issues. So it can't be, unfortunately, Melissa, it can't be done by Zoom. Mm -hmm. So it either would have to be, we'd have to delay it until the social distancing rules were relaxed or we could get a more appropriate venue. Would it be, uh, not, they definitely won't do it here, Chair, sorry. Again? They definitely won't come here. They definitely won't come here to, we've, we've asked that before, haven't we? The, the answer, no, they can't come here. The, the person is in Scotland, so we've said they wouldn't be able to come here at this stage. So we would be proposing the membership from here would be going to it's a Scotland city end. centre. No, there's a they've got an oh, office. the NCA office in Belfast. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. So we would be going to Bel that person would be coming to Belfast from Scotland or. No, what, what would be happening is be they, they would do it in their office through secure video conferencing. Uh, they wouldn't be able to do that up here because we don't have secure enough facilities to meet their requirements. Would it be possible to do separate... They say. What's that? <laughs> they say. They say. Would it be possible to do separate sessions for different committee member, as in take two groups of us in turn? Or would that compromise sort of... Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure that would be a possibility. I think uh, just sort of, I think I'm just taking the sort of the, the mood of the room. Look, there is enough people here who want to talk to the NCA, and there's enough people here who want to talk to the NCA, and there's enough cotton thrust of the debate where I think we, as all as a committee, or as many as we can be, should be present at that. And to restrict it in the numbers, I don't think is appropriate at this stage. We have waited this length of time, however, with re uh, restrictions, etc., being lifted as, as we go progressively through. I would propose that we delay it until we can actually get them either in front of us or we're in a situation where we can get more, more members of the committee at, at that stage, because I don't feel it's appropriate that it's just limited to three people, particularly since from the what you have heard. In the interim, would there be any merit in asking for a written update without prejudice to the fact we want to talk to them? I think that would be that would be acceptable. We could ask them for that due yeah. to the length of time. Are we content with that? Yeah. Content. Yeah. Gemma, happy? Yeah, that's a good plan. Okay. And then we seek as when the restrictions are lifted that we get them properly in front of the committee. Be content? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, can we now have uh, can we now ask Stuart to come in? Good 
Come on in, Stuart. Yes, oh yes. Yeah. Uh, Member Solicitor, to draw your attention that the letter we received from the Permanent Secretary at page 13, uh, which is circulated circular to all members on the 1st of June, seeking agreement to reschedule the in-year monitoring from the Department of Finance until 17 June 2020. Also included in your papers is an interim Department response to scrutiny, scrutiny points to, on in-year monitoring at page 14. And at page 3 in the table papers is a response from the Minister to a query from the Committee for the Economy which outlines the reprioritisation exercise and June monitoring. Um, I'd just like to inform you, on the 2nd of June, I instructed the clerk to inform the department that we would like officials to attend to outline the process being undertaken and to explain why, to this committee, they cannot provide oral evidence in the June monitoring at this stage. Stuart, over to you. Okay. Um, well, as you're aware, the June monitoring was commissioned and it would have taken the normal process of getting departmental returns in. We, uh, following that, then there was the executive commissioned a reprioritisation exercise. The reprioritisation exercise looked to address the fact that the executive has given out over a billion pounds in the COVID crisis and they're looking, there's still pressures exist within the, the COVID area. So they've asked departments to go and look at their lowest priority areas to try and stop or reduce spend in those areas to try and reduce initially the pressures on the COVID funding um, and also, if possible, to put forward additional measures um, that could go towards uh, addressing other departments' pressures um, within those. So it's a pretty comprehensive exercise that we're carrying out, a root and branch review of all the uh, if you like the services that are going on to try and assess if we stop them what the impacts would be um, and uh, if it's going to impact on any frontline services or services to other departments. So at the moment we're still going through that exercise and um, still going through the discussions with PermSec and the Minister to see what would be acceptable to put forward on, in, that, in their challenging role. So, we wouldn't be, that's why we haven't got the briefing today for, for the committee. We're not in the position yet to have finalised that and put forward. Okay. Uh, sorry, members, I just wanted to uh, draw your attention that uh, uh, the response from the Department of the Raised Paper in 2021 in your monitoring public expenditure, uh, which does require completion, is at page 14, just for your further edification, if you would like to have a look at that as we go through. Um, Stuart. What's the purpose of an in-year monitoring round? Uh, well, an in-year monitoring round is uh, an integral part, if you like, of the budgeting process, and there's usually three take part, and it's usually to allow departments to review their spending plans against what they spent and uh, normally put forward either bids, reduced requirements that can then go to the centre for uh, assessment by the centre and the executive finally to see whether the departments require additional funding or reduce their budget if they're given up reduced requirements. So it's, it's a reallocation and reprioritisation of the budget uh, across departments uh, throughout the year. So the process of monitoring expenditure by the departments, does that just happen sort of when you call for an in-year monitoring or does that happen continuously? That happens continuously uh, in that most depart well, all departments will be monitoring their spend against their budget profiles that they have, but there will obviously be variations to those and new uh, exercises, if you like, that come up for new programmes or new requests from ministers or executive take part. So we have to take all that into consideration while we're moving along throughout the year. So it would be fair to say that all the departments at the moment, providing of course they were doing their proper responsibilities and making sure that their spending was in line with what it's supposed to be, would be fully aware of what their pressures are at this stage? Um, they, they would be aware, well, this is a very exceptional year I have to say, you know, and there's a lot of estimates going on, for instance, in loss of income because of COVID, uh, maybe additional benefits being paid out, so this year is exceptional in the sense that there's a lot more work and a lot more estimation having to go on and refinement of figures than there would be in any other monitoring round that certainly I've faced in the past. Mm, well, you mentioned estimates, but of course we've been told that the main estimates, which we would have expected by now, have been put off until the autumn. 
sorry, when I say estimates, I mean estimates, of course. I don't mean estimates with the capital A, if you like, for, as in the budget bill estimates. Uh, I'm talking about assessment of what the pressures are going on, so calculation of income that's going to be lost in year, having to do forecasts of those, estimates of those are you know, very difficult at the moment, um, and we don't know what way the economy is going to go uh, in view of the COVID situation. So it's much more complex than it would have been in, in uh, past years or past monitoring rounds. But surely the purpose of an in-year monitoring round is to see where the departments are at the moment and sort of identify where the pressures. So surely we've got an indication from all the departments where their pressures lie at the moment. Uh, well, we have an indication. That's not to say that it's, it's, they can't be refined. And in, in addition, we're asking to, be, to dig extremely deep uh, in this particular reprioritization. In other words, stop things that we have been maybe funded for as part of the budget and look to see how those can be reprioritized and taken forward to help fund prior, uh, COVID pressures, which was, is a very different exercise than maybe the normal June monitoring would go, where you have your budget set to fund certain activities. Um, what we're being asked to do is go back and look at those activities that were being funded and say, well, can you stop doing those because we have a higher priority in the COVID funding at the moment? So go back and look at those. Sir, I'm, I'm a bit confused. How can the executive be looking at a reprioritization exercise if they don't know the state of where the departments are at the moment? Well, that's why it's being taken forward as part of the June monitoring. The two are interlinked together, quite right. You know, you, you can't know where your pressures are and I, uh, if you don't take it forward as part of the reprioritization. So the June monitoring is, is looking at, you know, even if you did um, have a money to give up now, if you have additional pressures, how you're offsetting those, and they're giving us a lot more flexibility as well as part of June monitoring to offset your own pressures. But how can the executive be doing reprioritization unless they've had a June monitoring round to be able to do the process? And if there's a June monitoring round around to allow the executive to do reprioritization, why is that information not in front of the committees? Because it's not complete yet. Um, how I, complete is it? Uh, in ours, it's not. Uh, well, we are well through the exercise. Uh, and how I would, well I, through? I, I, I would, well, it, it depends. We're not complete. And it's still the challenging role going on because we want to make sure we give up as much money as possible or deliver as much money for high priority areas from the low priority areas as possible. And the minister will challenge and the perm sec will challenge. So even though we have maybe put forward a plan, that will be challenged. We will have to go back and look at it. And I have no doubt that will carry on long after even the submission date of, of, of the 5th that we will continue and the centre will continue to come back if departments haven't reached the level required that they will be asked to go back and, and look again at those areas. So it, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. I mean, since the restoration of this assembly, and particularly from this committee, I mean, we've been asked to accept delays in main estimates, which we did because of the problems with COVID. We've been asked to look at multiple votes on account, which we did because of the issue with COVID situation coming through. <coughs> We have been reassured that there has been effective financial monitoring and indeed assurances were made to the deputy of this committee that good governance was ongoing. Yet we are being told today that the reason we are being delayed having this information coming to us is because there is a reprioritisation exercise that is about to take place in the executive. But you can't give us the reassurance that we have had the in-year monitoring so that the reprioritisation exercise of the executive can actually happen because they do not have the figures yet. And none of our committees have been given any of this information. So where are we? Well, what I'm saying is they're going on hand in hand. They're not being taken forward as two separate exercises. They're being taken forward hand in hand because there will be part of a realignment of budgets within, which forms part of the June monitoring exercise and feeds into the reprioritisation. So if you have pressures, you are being asked to look to see how you can fund those pressures from within your own budget. That reallocation will be done through the June monitoring process. So. It's, it's hand in hand, you know, they're, they're, they're two well, it's not because the committees are not being kept informed. But, well, the committee will be briefed on it, as the Minister said, before any decisions are taken on it, and, and he's given that assurance yesterday that the committee will be. I, I mean, it's not, we are not the only, I know, department that are struggling to get the information in as quickly as possible. Which other departments are struggling? Well, I think there's at least six other departments have, have now uh, put forward requests and been granted to delay their um, briefing until after the 5th. 
Matthew. Um, thank you, Chair. I just have a couple of really brief questions, actually, about um, in the, in the you might say this is a, a one for uh, your colleagues in supply division, but I guess it's relevant in your monitoring as well. Um, some of the money that was, um, w the background paper we got about this, the further vote and account and budget number two bill um, made clear that as part of the, um, uh, as part of that, there was a I think four or five stage process that the department went through in order to um, determine uh, uh, headings for each department, what would be in um, the further vote and account and budget number two bill, I think I'm right in saying, but um, it specified that there had been, of the n I think 90 something million that had been allocated to the Department of Infrastructure, I think 59.5 of that remained in a certain heading which was, could be reallocated later on in the process, is that right? Uh, I'm, I could answer that one for the Department of Infrastructure. I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Sorry. Um, is that part of your uh, part of the reprioritisation work, though? Is that going through um, COVID allocations that have already been made, where money hasn't been dispersed? Yeah. Well, it, it, it will be. It, we're looking at everything. In other words, money that has gone out, looking at profiles to see if profiles need to be changed. So, if money has been allocated under a certain profile. Has the impact, for instance, even on, on staff vacancies and things, has uh, the profile changed in those? Because we won't have the same recruitment going forward. Has, has programmes being delayed because of, of COVID, which may include some of the COVID programmes themselves. If some mm. of those need to be reprofiled, then that will have to be put set against the budget and, and seen whether you can give up some of that money or whether indeed you actually need more to fund some of the COVID programmes and those ones the reprofiling. And this is a, you know, it's a movable face. This is moving, changing all the time, as, as, as we know, and it is, is dependent on, on how the economy will react to COVID going forward. We're trying to do estimates based on the best information we have at the moment. Um, are there any particular departments that have been more recalcitrant in terms of providing information? Well, I, c can I just explain I'm here for the Department of Finance in itself and delivering it. PSD, even though it sits within the Department of, of Finance, almost sits above the departments and allocates out, uh, and it, that would be a question for them. Okay, that's fine for you, Manager. Okay. okay. Jim. Um, you said a few moments ago in answer to the Chairman that you'd had to go back to some departments because they hadn't reached the level required. What did you mean by that? You know, what, what I said is going forward that this will be an ongoing process and I have no doubt even when we put in the June monitoring returns that the centre will come back and say we still, uh, we still are, have pressures in, under COVID. So well, have departments been given any indications of percentage savings they need to make or anything of that not, nature? Not at present, but... I, I can only assume if we don't deliver on what is required, then that may be the next step is going forward. But, but surely a, a common denominator to both the monitoring round and the reprior reprioritising must be identifying where the slack is, never mind where the, the need is. Yep. And indeed, would one of the first things to be done not to be identify the slack has that not even been done? Well, as I explained, it, it has been done up to a certain extent, but we have programmes that we would be taking forward in our budget that may now be con and have been funded through the budget that may now be considered to be a low pri lower priority area than the COVID well, Before we get funding. to priorities, where, within which departments have you identified slack? Sorry, I, again, I, I, I can only speak for DOF. I'm not here as well, it's DOF, which does the monitoring round. Well, there, uh, as explained, sorry, D there's DOF. I am part of DOF, Department of Finance Director for DOF, and it, and its own services that we provide, the likes of shared services in Israel, those sort of areas. ESD, uh, Public Service Director, which is part of DOF, but sits to one side and uh, treats us as any other department when it's allocating money out. It sort of, if, if you like, acts as the exact so Would you have been giving us the, the monitoring briefing if we'd been having it? Sorry? 
would it have been you that would have been giving us the I, monitoring? I would have been giving you the monitoring. Um, I will be giving you the monitoring briefing for the Department of Finance. Then I assume PSD will be giving you the monitoring uh, briefing for the whole of the Northern Ireland departments once they yes, bring them I, th in I think the expectation of the committee was uh, that we were to get the oversight of the monitoring across departments. Right. Well, I'm, I'm glad I've been able to clarify that then. Um, but so there's been nobody sent to explain why we can't get that? Well, you, you certainly wouldn't have been able to get that today because the centre hasn't received in the, the returns because they're not due in until Friday. So you, you, there was no way that you could have had any sort of briefing on... What, what is the time frame now? It, the return dates for um, the monitoring and the reprioritisation exercise are the 5th of June, which is Friday. Right. And when do you anticipate... Sorry, just one second. Sorry, I forgot to cross you. So if the returns weren't due in for, until Friday, hmm? why had we been told what we were going to get briefed today previously before the Permanent Secretary wrote to us? I'm confused. I, I assume that... Uh, well, that wasn't I can't answer that question I, um, that's why we came and said no we couldn't have the information for you has this information been passed to the other committees because as far as I'm aware from the other chairs of the other committees we were expecting briefings and in your monitoring this week and indeed I think the questions from uh, department, the executive department, the committee infrastructure, health all the rest of them were expecting it this week as well yeah, well, and there are, there are all the departments that you've mentioned actually have now briefing, have put their briefing off. So when was the, the date of the 5th of June decided upon? Uh, maybe to go back, whom? June monitoring, normally the committee might, or usually would see before June monitoring is put in, would get an indication of what departments are going to put forward. I.e. the pressures that everybody's supposed submit, to know about. Yes, before you submit it. So that's why you would have had probably the, the briefing today. But the exercise has been complicated by the reprioritisation exercise, which has forced departments to go back and do a more root and branch and reprioritisation exercise that will feed into the June monitoring exercise. So it's meant a lot more work for departments and a lot more uh, uh, analysis of the information. But to, to go to um, Mr Allister's comment about the slack, the departments must already know if they're expecting to submit on Friday where the slack actually lies. So why isn't that being briefed to the committees? Because that, that slack will, well, as you put it, the slack will increase because we're now being looked, asked to give up even more than, than if you like, slippage in, in programmes. We're being asked to actually take money away from funded programmes where they are low prior, priority areas and include those as money um, to be used to fund higher priority the areas. So it's not a case of just... Uh, easements. It's a case of actually looking at where you can take money from existing programmes and put them... Surely not a case of austerity, is it? Uh, you used the word. Um, my final point was, working backwards then, when is the Minister coming to the Assembly to announce the June monitoring? Uh, I would have thought that's probably towards the end of June, but... Uh, don't have a date for that. There's no date you're working to? I would expect it would be towards the end of June. And when, uh, therefore, do you expect the committee to get the briefing we were expecting? Um, well, we, we've put a date. We've suggested the date of the 17th of June. Yeah. Thank you. Paul? Oh. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Stuart, for your attendance here. Uh, strikes me that you're not coping very well. I don't mean here, I mean in the overall management of this money. Is that a fair assumption right across the board? Uh, I'm not suggesting we're not coping. This is exceptional circumstances, as I think everybody would admit. I mean, COVID has come, um, obviously, like a, a boat out of the blue. Money, a lot of extra money has been required, and the executive's focus has been getting that money out to those priority areas, uh, as it should have been. Uh, now we need to help find out how we're funding. The Treasury has provided some money, but we need, still have pressures existing. We need to find out how we're going to fund the rest of those pressures. So 
it depends how you say we're not coping. I think this is part of the process of coping that we're now looking to see, well, how can we reprioritize some of our uh, lower priority areas to help fund that pressure? So that, that is, it's part of the exercise. So it's so from day dot, even when we were talking about a budget, and when we were talking about, and this, this is normal now, mm -hmm. we talked yeah. about a budget being aligned with the programme for government. The first question we would have posed, and I know we did, was about reprioritisation. Uh, about moving money around to fund projects that were essential and were needy and, and f were of, of great uh, capacity to the people of Northern Ireland and stop funding the things that we didn't need to do. And to me, that should be a normal process. So again, the Chair has asked this question, and I'm not sure we get a sufficient answer. What is the difference between a monitoring round and a reprioritisation plan? Well... You've raised a different question there, and you're basically what you're saying was the budget set correctly in the first place. Um, if, if you're going back to the point that you've argued before that there should be a reprioritisation within those, we can only say that we received our funding based on uh, what was put forward and was agreed by the executive. So they agreed that our funding was given to us to take forward what were considered to be the right projects at that time. The situation has moved on and it always will move on where there are higher priority areas take over and certain projects will move down the pecking order. And that's the position we're in at the moment where we're having to look and see, well, what are those projects that are now down the pecking order? In other words, to help fund those that have risen to so the top, which is the COVID pressures. Not to put words in your mouth, but what I think you're saying is that there's a fluid position all the time Yes, well, there is, yes. Now it's supercharged because of this influx yeah. of money, 1.2 billion of Barnet Consequentials that have been landed upon yeah. us, which has been very grateful, don't get me wrong, and then we have to spend it quickly. Is that the biggest pressure on you and other, other uh, financial officers in other departments? Or is it the fact that we're sitting at the minute around 100 million uh, over uh, spent, that there's another term that's used more technical term, but we're sitting, I think, with about 100 million overspent in projections. Is it 1.2 billion of new money, or is it the fact that we, I think it was because of the rates decision, we're now 100 million over? Yeah, well, the, the difference in, yeah, and I think you're alluding back to the budget bill, and the, which is more a technical point where you get uh, approval, if you like, to spend the resources you have and the cash that goes with that. Because so much money was spent early on because of the COVID situation, with various grants and things going on, we were going to breach that. So that was purely a technical thing. A lot of money was spent early on. Normally it's profiled differently across the year. And within your budget bill, you will have cover to allow you to spend well before the main estimates come in. Because, as you said, that you had an injection of, of money from Treasury, there was a lot more money being spent than was planned for within the initial estimates. So that's why there had to be a technical a further bill put through to allow more cash and more resources, because it gives you the legal authority to spend the money. You, you, you said uh, to an answer, I think it was uh, either to Jim or to the chair, that you are being asked to take money away. Uh, so it's, it's different. And I don't understand why it's different, because it should be always this, this case that you're now being asked to look deeper and you're now being asked to m remove funding from current schemes. And that's different from mon a monitoring round, is it? Well, well, it, it would be normally you would be funded. You wouldn't have this level of pressure going on across the executive. Uh, in, in many cases, you might actually have money to give out in, in monitoring rounds um, because it would be easy for money to give out. In, in this particular one, I think there's a particular deficit sits because of COVID, so we're looking to fund that. So it, may, it could be a very different type of exercise. So what, what is that deficit? Uh, I, I don't know the exact um, sum at who, the moment. Who would know but that? It's, uh, well, that would be coming from uh, the centre, PSD, and the Finance Minister. And how much money have you been asked to give back? Well, we, as we say, we haven't been asked to give out. Every, every department is to be asked to behave in a collegiate manner and give up what they can. First of all, say the first step was to look at your own pressures, uh, see how you can fund those. The second step was what can you give towards the centre uh, to help fund others, because there will be certain departments under more pressure than others. 
that seems a very broad brush approach that you know we're all meant to act collegiately together together the executives meant to do that anyway by the way so you're going to or sorry psd goes to all the financial directors within the departments and says right give act in a collegiate manner give us money back please uh you can see weaknesses in that well, that's the, that is certainly the role that the Prime Secretary and the Ministers play, and the Ministers being part of the Executive, that is what they're doing, is challenging their own departments to, get, to, to make sure they give up as much as possible. So, One second, so what are our what are our pressures then in the Finance Ministry? Sorry? What are our pressures? What are our financial pressures? Yeah. Uh, you obviously know them, so what are they? Well, we, ha we haven't bought them out yet. That, as I said earlier, a lot of them will but be... Your, we're putting in the monitoring round on Friday. Yeah, um, and we still have we still continuing to, to work with that and work with the minister to get it signed off by Friday, and we will hope to get that done by Friday. Do, do, do you think it's, it's wise to make decisions and form policy in two days? Uh, two days. So, so you don't know yet what you can give back and you don't know yet where you can cut within the Department of Finance but yet you have to make that decision by Friday? No. Is, well, it, is, it, is it right to make decisions like that in two days? Well I'm not saying we're making that decision in two days because the information has been gathered together so there, there's been quite a lot of work has gone into it and some reposition and we may have to go back and I'm sure this may well be an iterative process even though a submission may be due on, on Friday. I have no doubt that the centre and the executive will come back and may be looking for additional monies going forward. And departments themselves will probably be asked to continue to look to see if they can refine their bids and pressures going forward. Because it's not a matter of just your pressures way up here. Your pressures may come down as well if you get better estimates going forward of, of how these are. So I take your point about ongoing work. The chair asked you earlier, why can we not see that ongoing work? And why can we not implant our thought process in that? Well, I mean, as, as the uh, Minister promised, we, we will get the briefing on that and you will have your opportunity to, to input on that before the Executive makes any decision on this. Why, what, it would nearly be too late at that point. We would be seeing a, a decision paper that you have created for the Department of Finance. But why can this Committee of Finance not help you make those decisions? And then let us see the work that's ongoing. If we had a, and provided that ongoing work now today, you're going to make a decision Friday. Now again, short term as it is, we could have actually made suggestions to you. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, part of the process, I would want to get it cleared by our minister, and that's what he's looking to do: is challenge function first before. It goes to the committee, and I appreciate the committee. Yes, has certainly will have a role, and, and hopefully, give um, some good um, advice on, on maybe how we could improve on, on that. But um, going through the normal process of the minister and the firm sec challenging the role, but then the committee following. So, following so what is that, that normal process? Uh, so, who, who who first told you about a reprioritisation? Uh, that came out from uh, the firm secretary of. Finance. So the Permanent Secretary of Finance, Sue Gray, told you, and she would have written to all the other financial. Yeah, she wrote to all the Permanent Secretaries. Perm, perm secretaries. Yes. So then would have informed. Just for, just for clarity, sure. When was that? That was the 18th of May. Um, one of our months ago, right? Or but, yeah, about three weeks ago. Yep. Okay. Uh, and so you were told on the 18th of May to start this process. So there's there's been a number, a substantial number of weeks. Then you've been working on it. But it's really nice to see some of that work. Uh, really nice, because ultimately you're bound to be about 90% through your work, considering you have to hand it in on Friday. So you're about 90% through the process, the timeline anyway, at least. It's been really nice for this committee to see the 90% of that work that you have produced for your department. And again, I understand that we wouldn't have been able to see any of the other departments, but we're the Committee of Finance, and we would have and could have seen the Department of Finance's work on this, and yet we have seen nothing. Well, I think part of it is that there's no point in seeing part of the process. It, it's better to see the, the whole end result. Um, to give you part of it may actually give the wrong impression. It would be great to see, and it would be great to see work that we have asked for requested. It would be great.
of the department was to furnish us everything we've asked for. They haven't. And I don't have much faith that we'll get a transparent program or process that you've been conducting. Uh, your department is losing credibility. Again, it's not your department, but any comment on that? Uh, uh, well, it wouldn't be for me to say. Uh, oh, no, I know be, people. Uh, within not fair to ask. To be fair, I know no, people. I think, it is, I think uh, deputy. I think we've no, uh, we've, uh, we've got to that point. I'll end it there. Thank you. Yeah, Melissa. Uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, it's on you. Uh, Pastor, you're very, very welcome here today as well. Uh, and I didn't really expect um, any other information. Uh, um, and I look forward to the, the 17th of June, when in fact we will be in a position then to uh, brief this committee in every respect. Uh, in fact, just as the request had come in to me at the end of the week, at the beginning of this week, uh, from our secretary uh, about whether or not this meeting should be postponed until the 17th of June. Uh, I was totally in favour of that, and I couldn't understand. I thought actually there's a, a no-brainer asking people at this present point in time, when there are such pressures, and we can appreciate the amount of work that has to be carried out between now and Friday even uh, by your department, uh, and that uh, I do think that this was an imposition in your time as well to uh, request some people to come along here today. Um, that. Um, uh, the 17th of June, as I say, is an opportunity for each and every one of us then to scrutinise as it is presented to us uh, the full picture, not part of the picture or a bit of the picture or what we think it might be happening, but what will be happening. So, Gourmet Malgus Aries, just thank you for being here today. And as I say, my personal apologies, I can't apologise for the committee because I'm only a member of it, but my personal apologies that one was requested to attend on that basis today when in fact they should have been given that opportunity to uh, delay this response until the 17th of June. Oh. Yeah, uh, similar and I want to make a, I think this was an exceptional period, crisis, 1.2 billion out the door. I think uh, the department is coping, coping quite well in this scenario and I think if the officials came the day with 90% of the work, we, there'd be an outcry, particularly from the member who said this should have been presented, an outcry that it wasn't a complete piece of work. So I, I think it would have been reasonable to leave this for another week under the circumstances that has been. And I have no doubt we'll see it in, in the near future. So I don't know why the officials were the other day for which was a circular argument. They're doing their best, and we'll see it next week or the week after. Gemma, do you want to come in? No, um, I think Sean and Alicia um, expressed my concerns as well, so I don't have anything further on them. OK, thank you very much indeed. Um, Stuart, thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much indeed for giving your evidence as well. Uh, if we can have agreement team to receive the oral evidence of the in-year monitoring from the Department of Finance, Finance Division is now on the 17th of June. Are we content for that? Uh, just, Chair, can I ask, is, would that be all the departments, the suite of departments in the executive? Uh, that, okay. as far as I, I will be concerned, I will just be giving it for the Department of Finance. Yes. Uh, uh, sorry, as in not other departments, yeah. As I think the ex expectation is all the committees were expecting it by that time well, they, it should be in, so, um, but I, I don't know if, if the centre will have finished their analysis to be able to provide you with a, a central briefing at the time. But. Okay. Chair, from, from memory, the Minister is due to make a statement on the 23rd. 23rd in, of on Yeah, in your and uh, is scheduled to appear uh, officials before the committee from PSD on the 24th. 24th. Okay. Stuart. You're probably thinking, why me? Why did they send me to the committee today? But thank you very much indeed for your evidence. It's been some and I appreciate help. your position you're in, but we weren't letting you off of that. Okay. But thank you very much indeed. Thank Stuart. you very much. Okay. Okay, team, next up it's the evidence from uh, Mrs. Felicity Houston on the f functioning of government miscellaneous provisions in Bill. She's going to go. Um, the agenda item is being recorded by Hansard. I'd like to uh, come on in, Felicity. Take your ease.
think you're probably better off in that chair, just because somebody's sat in that one. So um, just bearing in mind our sort of social distancing and everything and all the rest of it. Uh, team, just to remind you, uh, the clerk's briefing paper is at page 20. Uh, Mrs. Houston's submission is at page 23. The code covering the appointment of special advisors page is on page 265 of the electronic bill folder. The previous code governing the appointment of special advisors, uh, 27th of June 2016, is on page 267 of the electronic bill folder. And the Civil Service Special Advisors Act, Northern Ireland 2013, is on page 384 of the electronic bill folder. Um, Plessy, would you care to make an opening statement? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, thank you very much, um, committee members, for inviting me along this afternoon. Um, I'll just take a few brief words for background further to what I've already sent in to you. I took the opportunity to comment on the bill because, as you may have seen from my paper, I have a long and rather extensive experience of selection and appointment at the most senior and sensitive areas of government, both here in Northern Ireland and in Westminster. As you will see, I was appointed by Prime Minister Tony Blair to the first House of Lords Appointments Commission. And you may have noticed from this weekend's coverage in the papers that those who get a peerage and those who don't still remain a source of great controversy and gossip. <laughs> I've also got extensive experience of codes of practice, drafting them, implementing them, and trying to enforce them. As the Commissioner for Public Appointments, I also had an unusual and possibly unique opportunity to see ministers and their special advisors operating across all government departments. Most civil servants are limited to seeing their own minister and SPAD or the occasional cross-departmental interaction. But my observations were that, to be honest, the relationship varied tremendously, depending on the personality, experience and confidence of both minister and special advisor. Some SPADs were clearly the shadow ministers. If you could get the SPADs attention, the minister would follow. Others were there more to protect the minister, particularly from any attack of the, from the civil service in full gallop. And one or two, I have to admit, were just there to make up the numbers. A ministerial perk, a little like the chauffeur-driven car or not having to carry your own a briefcase. So I hope my paper drew out for you some of the issues and dilemmas I see facing the committee as they examine this bill and try to find a way forward. And I've tried to support them with some examples. First, to consider the, code, the current code of appointment for special advisors that was published back in January. Well, for a post that's to be paid up to, I think, 95,000 from taxpayers' money, when let's face it, the average salary in Northern Ireland of said taxpayers is about 28,000, we have to ask ourselves, does this code as it now stands look like a credible document in the eyes of the public? Does a code which has set aside all recognized appointment procedures because of the personal nature of this bad appointment persuade this public that all is well? I was heavily involved in the referendum campaign for the Good Friday Agreement. I remember the enthusiasm and excitement when we all thought we were finally getting our own government. We would have our own lawmakers, which surely had to be better than being run as a colony from London. But recent events have shaken that belief and hope. Surprising numbers of people from the most unlikely walks of life now think we should maybe go back to, dare I say it, direct rule. And I think the, the job of the Assembly at the moment is to campaign to re-establish public confidence and clearly demonstrate that that's not a good idea and we don't want it. This, may, this bill could be seen as part of this campaign by demonstrating there's a genuine commitment to halting some of the frankly bizarre practices unearthed by Sir Patrick and his inquiry. So the committee must judge what message the current two-page code sends out and what they might want to do about it. And the other fundamental and more philosophical issue for the members here to think on is whether a code without legal underpinning can ever bring about thorough compliance. Codes of practice seem a great idea, pragmatic, they're swift to bring in, they don't require all the convoluted legislation, a reasonable approach, a genuine gentleman's agreement amongst good chaps. But unfortunately, speaking from personal experience, such codes get bogged down in obfuscation, distraction and clear obstruction. Of course, leg legislation is not without 
its issues um, and can be the subject of extensive litigation. And we've all suffered from the fact that much progress in Northern Ireland has actually been throttled by judicial review. It's often referred to as government by JR. Mm -hmm. However, despite that, I, do, I have found through experience and observation that, to be honest, the power of statute concentrates minds wonderfully. So, um, Steve, anybody, if they wish to ask some questions, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. Well, thank you very much indeed, and thank you for listening. Jim? Yeah, uh, could I just uh, stay with the Code of Appointment for a moment? Mm -hmm. uh, Sir Patrick Cochran was very vigorous in some of his findings, and indeed he was aghast at how the original Code of Appointment was simply ignored uh, by some. And in that context, he then had a recommendation, which was Recommendation 41, that there should be robust compliance mm -hmm. with both the letter and the spirit of the Act and the codes emanating thereunder. And of course, before that recommendation was even published, before the report was even published, the executive had unilaterally stripped out the code of appointment, taking out the need for us a panel of candidates, the need for a criteria for appointment, the need for a job description, the need to document the reasons and the process. In stripping all that out, how compatible was that, in your view as an overseer of public appointments, with what you would normally expect in the public service? Well, I mean, it isn't what is normally expected. That I, I itemise in my, my submission to the to the uh, committee uh, the basic things that should be one would expect in any uh, appointment process for any job anywhere, particularly one as well paid as this, of criteria, um, some form of assessment so that you can judge who's the person who seems to be the best suited for the job, and um, and a sub some sort of objective one, but. We do recognise in this case that the Minister has a, a very close working relationship sure. with the SPAD, so there may be some extra personal interaction required. And then some form of record for explanation. Because, I mean, th the thing I was struck by when I watched quite a lot of Sir Patrick's um, inquiry, and some of us were more junkies of it than others, I confess, um, was the, who are these people, these special advisors? They were trotted out, many of them, and one can't help but think, as I'm getting older, Goodness, those are young lads. <laughs> How did they have the skills and experiences? I wonder why they picked them. Um, and some of them had been in their jobs quite a while, and some seemed to have come straight from university. And, you know, for a taxpayer, <laughs> never mind somebody who has a particular interest in this, it kept striking me, how did these people get these jobs? Why was it him and not somebody else? And um, I think that that's one of the problems of leaving out these fundamentals and particularly some sort of um, explanation of why X is appointed, what they're bringing to the job. And that's one of the things that is, is, is lacking. And I mean, the code has just been stripped back to, mm. and the minister shall the, appoint, yep. and that's it. The, so, so when I drafted the bill, the old code was in vogue. And I must say, even I didn't expect that it would be stripped back the way it was. So, I'm contemplating an amendment which will put a statutory requirement to insert many of those things back into the code. Would that seem like a good idea? Well, given that if, if we have then the, the philosophical discussion about codes and whether we end up having to have them statutory rather than advisory, it, it is, I think, uh, it would provide tremendous confidence for the public if they thought that appointments like this, there was some evidence, some sort of process could be seen, and some sort of evidence was there of why X or Y had been appointed. And it doesn't have to be very, very detailed. I mean, these can be fairly broad things, mm. as I have suggest, suggested there. Um, criteria for selection, which encompasses the skills and experience required to do what is a very, very demanding job we all recognize. Um, an opportunity for the candidates who are considered to actually demonstrate <laughs> whether they can do this or not, and that can be done in different ways, but often initially an application form. Some sort of objective assessment of those people who are being considered for the job. 
and then records of that and why the successful candidate was selected. Those are the basics. We don't have, I mean, the, the previous code ran to 33 pages, much of which was actually an HR document that any civil servant at a different level would get much. It wasn't really about appointment. I think the previous was the Code of Appointment and the Code of Conduct, which yes, together it, ran to 30. Yeah, and it included pages. things like, you know, your holiday entitlement and yes, that shouldn't yes, be in yes, there. Yes. It could be longer. Yeah. It doesn't have to be 33 pages of it. Yeah. And it, yeah. it it got muddled up with what mm. would be a document expected But, but codes, service. of course, sit below legislation. Yes. So if legislation says you shall have a code and it shall cover the following issues, yes. that necessitates it covering those. It can also cover much more. Yes. Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. It doesn't need to be prescriptive. And I think yeah. that is probably the way to do it, to have some of the key, uh, the fundamental principles of good assessment, good selection, good appointment there. Without yeah. no, You don't have to be... Um, producing all sorts of information and records about individuals' mm. personal history and things. Mm. It's not like that. Could, but is it is possible to summarise such things. Could I ask you about the other part of your written statement? The functioning of government bill is wide in its ambit. So it is capable of addressing other things than are presently in it by further amendment. You drew our attention to the fact that you held in office as a Commissioner for Public Appointments, which, in your view, wasn't sufficiently independent, mm -hmm. didn't have the powers that, say, your Scottish statutory appointed counterpart had, couldn't stop a competition mm -hmm. if it wasn't been run properly. Just elaborate for me, if you would, on how the Office of Commissioner for public appointments could be improved? Because that's something we could do in this mm -hmm. bill. Um, I would certainly suggest that you speak to my the current commissioner, who's obviously working with whatever environment she has at the moment. Mm. But um, So I don't pretend to be on top of the detailed structure at the moment, but certainly things don't seem to have changed much. And the commissioner between myself and the current one resigned in uh, um, what was it, despair of what was going on. The issue has always been that basically because the legislation is very loosely written, the order that sets up the... the uh, In fact, it's a prerogative order. It wasn't even legislation. No, no quite. It's a prerogative order. Absolutely. Um, it just says there should be a commissioner and you can do these things. But what it doesn't say is that um, <coughs> the commissioner must have control of his or her own budget. And I was not a budget holder at all. That you can't, the commissioner couldn't um, appoint their own staff. That sort of thing. Um, no, no, those basics. So my staff were civil servants seconded to me, mm -hmm. not by my choosing, though I would never criticise any of them that I had, but that's not the point. Um, I was initially, when I took the job over, previously it had been done by the, the commissioner for GB. She was also um, part-time commissioner. She hadn't even got an office. When I set up, my office was put in castle buildings which I found people who wished to come and see me found it very disconcerting and confusing because they saw this independent person who was supposed to be a sort of regulator sitting right in the middle of the structures of government. And I have to say, when I raised this with civil servants, they couldn't understand it because it was their workplace. And why wouldn't I be happy? Because I had a nice office, <laughs> so I should be all right. And couldn't understand again why I would be unhappy about not having my own staff. I mean, one, one of the few rules that rules that is clearly laid out for the commissioner is to audit appointments and due to a set of circumstances and up for the committee we ended up without an auditor um, and we're not talking a financial order this is a process <laughs> auditor and the, the civil service which was OFM DFM just refused to help me find a new one I wanted to impose somebody on me etc etc <coughs> and eventually the the controller and auditor general at the time lent me a member of his staff because I didn't have an auditor and I wasn't allowed to have actually the person I had wanted. I was prevented from doing that by the civil service. And so I then got somebody from a department that everybody recognizes is entirely independent, etc. And thankfully it was John Dowdle at the time was a CNAG and he recognized the difficulties I was having. And he actually had to lend me a member of staff. Now, I, the commissioner for public appointments shouldn't have to borrow a member of staff from the CNAG to be able to um, actually um, fulfil one of her very few <laughs> clearly laid out statutory duties. But lacking financial independence, lacking the ability to point staff caused tremendous difficulties. 
So um, I think that I certainly say I would want the, the current commissioner, obviously, to, to um, tell you how things are these days, but that you cannot have a regulator who cannot appoint their own staff. And the staff that were being appointed were to multiple quangles. Oh, no, I'm talking about my own personal team. Yes, but the staff yes. that you were overseeing. Oh, yes. Well, they were the, they were the, the public board appointments members. of. Yes, board members. Yes. Um, not, not, the pe not the functionary, so to speak, but no, the actual no. oversight board. And there was two, the, I don't know how many quangas we had back then, 70, 80 of them, yes. And we would have overseen, yes. in some way or other, the appointment process of that. Uh, so, so just tell me a little bit about the Scottish system where a commissioner who's unhappy with how a process has been operated can stop it. Um, I, I note that um, the system has changed in Scotland mm. since my day. All right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, perhaps the, the illustrious first minister of Scotland. Yes. So, yeah. mm. yes. Um, things have altered, but when I yeah. was commissioner, um, the Scottish Commissioner had been set up, they had taken, instead of just copying over legislation or order from England, they had actually written their own piece of legislation to set up the Scottish Commissioner's office. So she had authority to appoint her own staff, uh, a budget of her own allocated to her, and then she also had, more importantly, um, the power to halt a com uh, competition for a public appointment if she believed that things were not being done correctly and in compliance with the code. And she could also, she had a duty to present a report anyway to Parliament, I believe, every, Scottish Parliament every year. But she also had the right to produce a, present a report to the Scottish Parliament if she believed a, a minister had contravened her code and, and basically it hadn't been resolved. Most, most of these incidents are resolved. That's in statute in Scottish. It was, yes. Now, I can't put hand on heart and say quite why it works now, because in Scotland they amalgamated several commissioners into, I think, the, sort of the equivalent yeah, public standards commission. Mm -hmm. So things will have changed because of that. But they recognised, certainly back then, the need for this sort of clarity um, and the authority that comes with having your own legislation, which is why I flagged up the contrast between how my office was treated and the information commissioner who was established fully, even though it was an office here in Northern Ireland, we didn't have a separate commissioner. There was a strong recognition of the need for that office to be separate, independent, etc. Just, 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 just a quick one about the, particularly the role of the Scottish, mm. and, I've, and I'm recollecting here. Mm. The reason why they decided to do that is because it was deemed to be Scotland's unique circumstances with the Scottish Parliament and the roles of sort of the various uh, places. That's why they wanted to put it on a statutory basis. We have heard from the permanent secretary here David Sterling, he referred, I think he referred in his evidence about four or five times in the same sort of the same session, he referred to the unique circumstances mm -hmm. of Northern Ireland. And again, that sort of raises the question of, you know, we've been asked to look at in your previous roles. Mm. We've been told by quite sort of senior civil servants, including Sue Gray here, who worked very closely obviously in the Cabinet Office. Mm -hmm. And it was the purpose of using sort of not going to a statutory basis was it would be the pressure of public opinion or whatever it is would force people to be able to change their behaviour and modify their behaviour in the way they've done. Yet, when Scotland was placed in this situation, they decided to go down the statutory route because there needs to be weight to the decision making process. Could you just quickly have a, 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 your, your perspective on the sort of the difference between sort of, and because you have identified two distinctive mm -hmm. systems? Mm -hmm you know, the pros and cons of either, just so that we can get that clear. Yes, um, well, as, as you said, absolutely. Scotland, when their parliament was established, they decided with many of their structures, obviously, to take it and peel it back to, and you know, the basics. And maybe partly because it's a parliament rather than an assembly, that may have given them a certain outlook on how to write their statute. Um, and it did mean, say, that the commissioner had that sort of power and authority. I mean, it didn't prevent her from having many a run-in <laughs> with oh, you know, yeah. senior members of the uh, Scottish uh, governance, government system. Um, but it did give her that, um, the final sort of um, oomph. And she did have this issue that she was able to decide where she actually wanted to sit and run her, her office from, which may sound petty, but it isn't. It's part of the things that are recognised internationally as a standard for independence. I mentioned the independent international ombudsman's organization. They have- Sorry, but the international- Ombudsman's, oh, I think it's the organization, I think they call themselves these days. Um, and they have, yes, the International Ombudsman's Association, sorry. They have a set of sort of standards to recognize and you know, um, a measure an independence of 
an ombudsman, a regulator, somebody who deals with complaints, these sort of things. And there were a series of tests like being, having control of your own funds, having your own staff, etc. And I, and I, when I was commissioned public appointments, my office failed all of those. The Scottish commissioner would have had, would have been able to say, yes, tick, tick, I have all that. So that was, um, I, I, I think, a good situation. So it did come out of that. So the reason we ended up with what we had was because I believe the Commissioner for Public Appointments was set up in England, mm -hmm. and it was for GB. And then, oh goodness, there's Northern Ireland, so we'd better stick that on, and so we'll write, we'll, we'll write a prerogative order to set, give us one, but it's not really a separate person cause, or a body, because the Commissioner's based in England. And that went on for quite a while. And then when it was decided, it, well, Peter Hayne appointed me, Forgive me if I can't just remember the particular structure the assembly was going through at that point, but he appointed me. It had been decided that there would be a Northern Ireland, a separate Northern Ireland Commission, and I was appointed. But the, nothing was ever thought about, do we need to look at the legislation, etc. It was just sort of left. And then, I mean, to defend OFM, the FM, who would think I would say that, um, they, they were kind of left with it and no, no particular guidance as to what to do about how this commissioner should be looked after, run, etc. So it was just left like that. But it did mean that we struggled along. And, mm -hmm. and there's this constant issue of whether your code is, is if have, we have to follow it or not. Special circumstances, or as I said, that can just be set aside. I think in Scotland, there were less issues like that at the time. Um, I think there would be more respect for what the commissioner in Scotland was trying to do, that sort of thing, because ultimately, you know, there was her piece of legislation. It's the force of law behind it. And, and that helped, because whereas I just got constantly being told, that's outside your remit, 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 like frogs. Um, but nobody ever had a clar could clarify quite what the remit was. And I wasn't allowed to take independent legal advice, nor was I allowed to use the government legal service to look to see what I, my position was in certain things. Well, if you can't get independent legal advice and you can't use the government's legal service, what could you do? Uh, exactly. Uh -huh. argue and say and then they would just often I would be told but I'm sorry but uh, that's legal opinion is that and you don't have the money to do that in fact you don't control your own budget so you can't take legal advice I used to go and talk to the Attorney General sometimes <laughs> but that wasn't an official response he did occasionally help by replying to a letter to me but that's not the same thing so it's stuff like that went on all the time and and I think some of it came from say the lack of statutory authority and then um, a code rather than legislation that need, you know, the, the power of legislation. And the code for practice for public appointments is a, minister, is a code for ministers to use, and, uh, and of course the civil servants by way of working for the ministers. But in England at the time, the ministerial code said that if a minister failed to follow the code of practice in England, he was in breach of the ministerial code. We didn't have that in our ministerial code here. So there was even less. <laughs> Um, pressure within the system to, to comply because there was no sanction of any sort when, when they, they didn't follow the code of practice for appointments. It was just, as I've said, a flurry in the press, maybe some embarrassment, and then we moved on. Thanks. Matthew? Thank you, and thanks for coming and giving evidence. Um, you have to, you've talked a bit about um, public appointments and your experience as a, the Commissioner. Um, do you think um, SPADs are public appointments or political appointments? Well, they're political appointments. They're Should they be public appointments? Well, that's that's really not for me. I don't, don't really know what that would bring to the, the party, really. I mean, a public appointment is normally, as I explained legally, it's quite messy, but le normally it's for, an organi for something that is at arm's length from a, a minister, yeah. so that they have that distance, that they put somebody somebody in to yeah. run something, but they're not actually run, directing them, uh, responsible for them, etc. I'm not sure what it would bring to the party to make them public appointments as That's such. Understood, but the implication of your evidence is, certainly the oral evidence today, is that SPAD appointments don't meet standards for mm -hmm. public appointments. Oh, any appointments. I mean, this is not just public appointments. I mean, I don't think within the Civil Service Commission they make they meet the standards that are expected. 
wouldn't meet the standards that you know, as in to be appointed a civil servant through recruitment um, do you think so you talked before about um, Westminster and comparisons with Westminster um, and direct rule as well mm. um, do you think you, I presume you don't do you think that we should be reverting to direct rules no, no, that's why I said I dare okay. hardly mention it I just mentioned that it, it had become quite a an issue before Indeed. the assembly came back and it is one of the remarkable outworkings of the lack of confidence the public has in the assembly that more and more people were starting to say and I mean the, the, that we should go back to direct rule and I mean I think it would be a terribly <coughs> bad state of affairs but you would accept that spads are not that the, in a sense spad appointment standards are in effect roughly the same in Westminster as they are here in that they don't they don't, they don't meet the standards you've talked about no I don't know how they're really appointed in England at the moment I mean I see from reading the research papers and so on the Prime Minister is ultimately responsible for the appointment um, and it has always been one of those mysteries how special advisors get to where they are and why they are throughout the country um, but I do think that this is as we're saying about an opportunity for Northern Ireland to do it better so you're, what you're effectively saying is that Northern Ireland should go further than really any jurisdiction in, I don't know about continental Europe, but it would sound like, uh, I'm fairly sure in the Republic of Ireland, there, there's no, it's roughly the same in that they're political appointments, and as we've talked about um, in GB, particularly at Westminster. So you're saying that basically we should go further, we should be a model. Well, I think that would be a very good idea. And I mean, we have to remember the context in which we are looking at this, of what we has, what and this, curtain was pulled back what we found out was going on and and uh, within the special advisor environment due to the RHI and so on so I think you know it is an opportunity for us to say right we recognize that things haven't been done as we how would you go about given both the Westminster SPAD code of conduct and the new one that was introduced here earlier this year specify that a SPAD is appointed as a political advisor, someone to advise a minister on how to handle their party, what, what political issues they need to face, you know, stuff that really, the implication is that you basically have to understand the, the content. I'm a member of the uh, SDLP, I'm an SDLP, uh, oh, fairly recently I'm a fairly, I'm an SDLP MLA as of the last few months. I would hope that if I'm uh, ever, I don't think I'd ever be in a position to uh, appoint a SPAD, um, but if I am, or if someone else in my party was, or some, in any party, there is the, the broad understanding that that person, whether they're a member of a party or not, they need to understand the complexities of that person's political context. Would it be quite difficult, do you think, to write that into an acceptable, how do you, how do you, write, how do you write that into a, 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 a conventional appointments process, if you see what I mean, given that most appointments processes now and to say, you know, filter that out, as it were, for kind of for, for very good reasons in terms of equality and um, and all the rest of it. But if you're saying um, that in order to be a spad for the Conservative Party or for the Labour Party or for the SDLP or for TUV or any other political party, um, you have to meet the appointments that you would have to meet for, for example, the Civil Service Code, which requires n no discrimination um, on the grounds of belief or. Do you see what I mean? Is there a oh, contradiction yeah, there? This is why the, the code does have to be different for special advisors, because we've always accepted that they are political. They are not. They may be civil servants for the terms and conditions, and who pays them, but they are not functioning in the way a civil servant normally does, with the the disinterested um, uh, role that they have. So it is necessary. I mean, it's also. It was always when uh, with public appointments, it, the minister on the advice of his civil servants to decide on the criteria and the job, the special skill, mm. et cetera, that he or she wants for the people they're about to appoint. And that would be the same here. And a minister is, one would expect them to appoint people who have similar political views to them. But that's up to them. And it's not unrealistic to be able to write a criteria about understanding how a political party works, whatever their policy objectives are, and so on. It doesn't mean that they have to have actually, um, you know, uh, signed up to them exclusively to be able to understand them. But it is very much a ministerial decision, that sort of thing, about what is what they want. But I mean, I think if when I used to many years ago, you worked with Damien McAteer, who was uh, Seamus Mallon's 
first uh, okay. special advisor. Uh, Damien was a, a, a well-known economist. He was also worked in business, etc. He ran his own company. So, so it was quite obvious why Damien had been Seamus Mann's per, um, special advisor. You know, he was a man of great experience and eminence and, um, and had great ideas and so on about how Northern Ireland might be improved. So, you know, that, that sort of made sense. And in, this was in the very first days of appointments when really, you know, the, as far as I know, they may have, he may, Seamus may only have had one special advisor, which is very different. But um, those sort of things are, you know, when you're the Deputy First Minister and you're trying to set up a country on this, you might want a specialist economist who would know about but also understand the context in which Northern Ireland is up. So those are the sort of things you might be looking for. You, you, what, you're sort of say, what you're saying is really then that part of the fraying of public confidence is they just see people who are, um, who are appointed without qualifications. It, that seems to stray into a, kind, a broader question, less about conduct and more about experience and... Well, it's part of it. Um, it's part of the public um, the confidence issue. I keep using that phrase, but you know, the public <coughs> don't understand how these young men, as they were to their eyes, have been doing these jobs and they are so well paid. And goodness, they didn't follow the codes and apparently the conduct was very strange. And why were they there? And it's not an unreasonable thing for people to ask. You know, when you look at a senior civil servant, you know that he's or she's been in the job for years and there's their career and so on. So you can see most of the time why this is the permanent secretary and he's, or she's got to where they are. But these people, <coughs> many of them seem to have come straight out of university. And I think the public just thought, what? Whereas if there was evidence that these skills that they had were recognised, they had done their research in I don't know, green energy schemes, shall we say, for the sake of argument, um, and had experience in, in that sort of thing, then maybe people would understand, or they had, um, well, I'm, I'm going to start harder and harder to come up with examples of sort of speculation of what it might be, but those sort of things. It's just asking for like an explanation as to why, not that you'd pick the wrong person or we're going to argue with it, but this is the evidence. But you have a very brief question, Chair, for me. Yeah. Um, uh, your length questions are normal, short questions. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be shorter than the normal. Um, just as a, as a very experienced ombudsman, um, how do you think you would have handled a complaint, for example, if it was in an enhanced, the kind of enhanced um, uh, public appointments or ethical standards commission office in Northern Ireland, which is what they have in Scotland? It sounds like you're advocating that. How would you have handled a complaint about an, a, a very, the most powerful advisor of all? Um, driving across the country in the middle of a public health emergency and um, being seen to undermine confidence. Presumably you would think that's a, a pretty shocking... Oh, I'd have recommended he was sacked. <laughs> Good, so that's a good short question, short answer. And my final question is about the Ethical Standards Commissioner in Scotland. Um, do you know if that's... I, you mentioned it's on a statutory footing as in it was created by legislation. Oh. This actually just as a... The Commissioner of Public Appointments at Westminster is, I think, also created by an order in council, um, Peter Riddle, and he may be someone we want to take evidence from. Just a thought, but the Ethical, Commission's, Ethical Standards okay. Commissioner in Scotland, you say they were created by legislation. Do you know if the code that they enforce or the codes that they enforce are in statute or just No, codes? I'm sorry, I don't know. So there's been a lot of reform and change in Scotland in yeah. the past few years, so I'm, I'm not on top of the details of that, no. Okay. okay thank you. Paul? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for your attendance here. It's been very informative. Uh, I have a couple of uh, angles to go at here. Uh, it's probably been covered anyway with, with the range of questions you had, but one was on the on the merits of uh, an appointment. Uh, whereas we've always sort of been concentrating on the conduct of someone or an M post, yes. uh, but the merits of you know. So it, we're clear that it is a political post. Mm -hmm. um, a political appointment by the political party or, or a minister uh, to be a, you know, spad for that minister. Uh, and I get that. Uh, and I get how it wouldn't work for civil servants to be in that space. Uh, it would undermine the civil service, if anything else. Uh, but I think what you're trying to suggest is that, or you're, what you're suggesting, sorry, is that there basically has to be some sort of performa filled in as to the rationale for that appointment whether it be in merit, experience, qualifications and specialities. Just something to present to the public. Yes. 
Would that be right? I think, as, as a bare minimum, absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the changes I did bring in when I was Commissioner for Public Appointments, and this say uh, these are about Quangos, obviously, Bob and Spads, was that permanent that the there had to be a note of the reasons why the minister had chosen the individuals he did or she did to appoint, because previously nobody had any idea, and actually that was as much for feedback for the unsuccessful candidates yes. as for the public. Mm. It often didn't, wouldn't often mean in the public domain, but it could be if required, but it was really for that. And it is that, it's about the rationale, and the minimum, I think, should be some sort of biographical note that explains why this person is the person that the minister has decided is the person to work with. I would like more than that. I think that the code should ask for, as I've suggested, the minimum of criteria, which, you know, it gives a minister an opportunity to think about what they would like if they're SPAD, because we did hear in the RHI of ministers just getting doled out SPADs. <laughs> yeah, they're having this one and that one's over there. And that's not, that's not how it's supposed to work. It's supposed to be a, a, a working relationship where people can work together for a positive outcome for, for the, the minister in, in his or her job. So I think the minister, given the opportunity to look at the criteria and actually think, well, I would like a special advisor who I've got some ideas here, our new policies are going to be about this, and I would like to have somebody help working with me who knows about this. You know, imagine if um, uh, Minister Swan at the moment has decided to try and sort out our problems with social care. He might decide he would like a special advisor who actually knows about it, has worked in it, or has done a lot of research on it, or something like that. So you're not just having a complete generalist or somebody who actually knows nothing about it, but has come in from a geology degree. Um, one of the firm. Uh, so, um, you know, that, that's the sort of thing that, that actually having it laid out gives the minister almost an opportunity to think about it. It's a positive thing for them. And then for the whole issue is how you find your pool, and that one is, is a, a complicated one in this particular environment. But then people who are asked, would they be interested, they can then somewhere or other in a short application demonstrate what they've got going for them. So you're actually suggesting, though, that the be a recruitment exercise? Well, I mean, that, that's one word for it. You know, they are recruited special advisors. You know, they just don't wake up one morning and sit, find themselves sitting in an office. They have been recruited or appointed, selected, you know, what does the word mean? Um, you know, and shouldn't ministers have a chance to look at one or two potential advisors, which is what a recruitment exercise could be called? and then say that's the one, he or she, that's the very one. They've, I really like that policy paper that wrote a couple of years ago on how we should fund social care. That's the one I want. It strikes me, though, with that process that it seems to me most SPAD appointments throughout the democratic world is that you have to have a really deep and meaningful relationship and trustworthy relationship with your minister, mm -hmm. SPAD to minister, mm -hmm. minister, SPAD. So there probably have to have been a knowledge, at the very least, of the person where they were appointed. Uh, and I don't know if a political appointment like that could be pushed through a churn of a recruitment process where there would be losers. You know, you know, mm. if, if you're a minister and you wrecked your brain as to the, the uh, expertise in the country on a certain subject like energy, so I'm interested in energy, so I know a lot of people, a lot of players in the energy game. You would imagine me, as a minister, going to one person and saying, look, would you want to be my spad? I think you would bring something to it. And he would say, no, I wouldn't want to get anywhere near it. And then you go to somebody else or she, uh, and, and you ask them uh, until somebody says yes. But you wouldn't really want to advertise, I'm looking for a spad, please roll up. You know, you know how. You yeah. Oh, I mean, I, it, it is one of the difficulties. It's because of what, what's referred to as the pool, where you find these people and how you get them to uh, to come forward. Um, and but I mean, even the previous code did say that there should be a selection of candidates. So that you know, candidates. The minister mm. was supposed to consider candidates. Um, so even back then, there was an expectation that there would be some sort of judgment of that. If that is impossible uh, politically, uh, it, it's seen as impossible. The ministers don't want to be seen picking then it just the minimum has to be some sort of record, some sort of a set, uh, written note of why this individual mm -hmm. has the mer is meritorious enough to be paid 95,000 pounds a year I understand yeah. can I take you into the world of Quango land again um, <clears throat> you were the commissioner of public appointments 
but you've demonstrated today that you weren't really independent. Some, so you had an independent mind and an independent voice, but ultimately, if you don't own your budget, mm-hmm. you can't control your budget, mm-hmm. and even if someone can tighten that budget string on you, you have to argue if, if there's a real level of independence there for fear of them taking money off you. Absolutely. Uh, and that's something that worries me even in Quango land today, mm-hmm. where you have very powerful, or you should have very powerful influential groupings out there who can do a very good job for the consumer. And, you know, implicitly, implicitly the department could phone them up and say, look, these should be commenting on that, but really have the expertise. Well, to me, that's an implied threat. Yes. Uh, you know, be careful what you're saying here. The budget might be coming up next year. Mm-hmm. So you, you lose a degree of independence if you're fearful of that. But were, were you, how was the process? Because my mind tells me that it's the minister that points appointments on to bangles hmm. and boards. So what was the role of the Commissioner for Public Appointments? Uh, the Commissioner so sets the standards, writes the code of practice for appointments, sets which are a set of standards which are to be used for all relevant public appointments, which, as I said in my paper, can be complicated enough. Um, and that's the role. And then to oversee its implementation, provided many advice to ministers and civil servants on how it's to be implemented, um, to deal with complaints where the code hasn't been followed, to audit competitions, i.e. look at them to see if they've complied with the code. And also, that things have changed a bit, but when I was commissioner, Many of you will be aware from any form of recruitment process nowadays that as well as the people who work in the area, there's often an independent person sitting on the board or a selection panel to bring absolutely independence, a fresh eye, etc. And when I was commissioner, um, I was responsible for uh, the allocation of commissioner's assessors to panels to sit there to be the um, the person that would try and ensure on the ground that the code was being applied. So that was another role of the commissioner, and it meant that that helped the job, knowing what was going on at selection stage. And those selection panels then would come up with a number or a pool of names? No, it was up to the minister. The minister could either say, if he was a chair, say that they were looking for, I'd like a pool of names, or just one. Okay. Uh, so that's a ministerial decision. And then the pool of names. No, but very often it was a pool of names of people who had passed the necessary threshold of assess by assessment, and then the minister would decide of those people who he or she wished to appoint. My, my experience, knowing some of the boards and working closely with some of the boards, uh, in my career and, and my my passions, uh, strikes me that you, you come across individuals who happen to be on a number of boards, mm. <laughs> and even Wait. even to the point golden where, circle, even to the point where you could actually ask Barry whether it's a conflict of interest. Oh, well, that's uh, a, that's, how long have you got? <laughs> yeah. yes. uh, is that something that you, well, is that, well, I'm asking you, is, is that something that you, you've experienced of and was concerned about even back then? It's a problem of, um, not even, people are convinced that certain people are sitting on loads of quangos. What it tends to actually be is that they move from one quango to the next to the next. You know, we used to play at home, guess who? Name that, you know, name that quango sitter. Who's got the job this time? And it's, there are lots of people now. Part of it comes from their experienced people who know how these organisations run, and they. But can just to, just to, just to inter, digest, or interrupt there just slightly. Um, obviously, one of the things, if you write the essential and desirable criteria for every board member, that seems to read as a retired senior civil hmm. servant who happened to be a PUS grade. The only time that you're ever going to get any people who are going to be on those boards are retired senior servants of PUS grade. Outrageous suggestion. <laughs> But am I incorrect? It is the problem, like a points like. I mean, this is a fundamental issue with throughout recruitment selection everywhere, like a points like. It is, um, it is a fundamental challenge to say to the civil servants, who were normally people drawing the, drafting the criteria which the ministers would then agree, to say we have got to stop asking for somebody who's had five years' experience sitting on a board. Why? Um, and five years within the, you know, the last or the last ten years, but if you'd had eight years, that there was well, that's too many years, um, and you must have experience of um, oh, I know, um, project management, and that would only be interpreted in the civil service con- understanding of what a pro- project management was, 
or budget holding or um, working with government um, agencies and all this sort of thing. And you just got the same things over and over again. And it was very difficult to try to get those who were doing the same thing um, to come up with new ideas. I mean, I used to unkindly suggest that they pulled the file out one appointment ten times, blew the dust off it, and just reused it. No, so that's a little cruel, but it did feel like it sometimes. Um, to bring fresh thinking is a real challenge. And do, do, do you worry that there is, there is real conflict of interest whereby some of the most powerful bodies uh, and, well, semi uh, um, private company relationships uh, could well be voting boards uh, for their own interests? I, well, I can only think of one. I think one we're sort of straying slightly off the topic here, yes. but I'll, I'll allow this one because I know exactly where you're There's going. There's one organisation in the construction business, I can't go, which is, is, is by its very makeup, it's unavoidable because the people who are on it have to have specific rules within the business. So, you know, there is a real issue there. I mean, it's, it's, it's an institutional thing. It's not the fault of the individuals. The bigger problem, to be honest, Paul, is um, people who don't recognize a conflict. And not only do they not, but often very senior levels of the civil service do not recognize it. And therefore, people were doing the most extraordinary things. Um, and a very famous example from some years ago now was the Northern Ireland Tourist Board, when the chairman of it, um, who, they had a very large uh, printing and publication contract, the Tourist Board, and the chairman ran a printing and publications company, and he got the contract. Not only did he get the contract, but he had actually ensured that other companies were not able to apply for the contract. I mean, that made it, because we had no assembly at the time, that made it to the Westminster Public Accounts Committee, who said they'd never seen anything like it in their lives. That's a very extreme version. I have to say it didn't prevent moving on to other bodies either. But um, that's an extreme version. But that's one of the things. And it has been endemic and an issue. And I think civil servants just really can't imagine that people would do such a thing. And that's where we sometimes, a bit like some of the evidence we saw for RHI, where they did seem to be gobsmacked that people would take advantage of, of you know, financial information that happened to come their way. So yeah, it's, a, it has, it's been a fundamental problem. Um, my successor, the, the current commissioner, might be interesting to find out her views on how things are, if they have got better. And just to sort of... Yeah. Sorry, just to, just to take that back slightly, because one of the, the, the big question we have here is it's coming down to whether we accept the process of using a code and that process, or we go to a statutory basis, because if we hear it time and time again the unique circumstances of Northern Ireland. But what we have seen across many aspects of public life in Northern Ireland, there is nearly, a, and I hate to use this terminology, but nearly like a Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> that they all seem to be sort of all part of the sort of the same process. And we are not really getting good thinking and fresh thinking about where we're going forward. And again, if we were a, if we had a much bigger pool to pull from, but we can't. So therefore we're looking at, you know, we, we're not being able to allow the normal pressures to apply because of the implications of it is, but that's it. Have you- That's me finished yet, thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks for the presentation. Uh, we had the Human Rights Commission in last week, and one of the key issues and difficulties here we're talking about um, in terms of legislation around proportionality, right, and how do you find it? Because what uh, misdemeanors then falls in, because you have the criminal law, if somebody breaks the law, it's fraud or whatever, then the due process. So this is a very difficult one. Where do you stop in terms of um, proportionality? The other one is whistleblowers. You know, Sam McBride was here. He got a bag of emails from a particular party. Now, a person could argue that uh, they were, it could be two ways, that they were acting in the public interest, or they could be divulging internal information, sensitive information. And therefore, a legislation may uh, deter people who would want to um, uh, make known malpractice within any organisation or in government or SPAD. So, and uh, you talked about um, 
bizarre practices by a host of uh, spads and you're watching the RHA like many other people. What difference would it make to the behaviour of those people who are dishing out the information, acting on behalf of their friends? Um, what difference would uh, legislation have made? Because, and finally, Sue Gray was here. She has maybe a similar background to yourself, an appointment as far. She has said that this is robust. These are strong and the strongest uh, codes in these islands. And all parties, five parties, were uh, part of the negotiations of the restoration of this place in bringing these codes about. Um, yes, well, um, I think there was quite a, I haven't watched all the evidence, but I've seen some of it. And one of the issues that was talked about was the culture within the system. And that is fundamentally what has to change. And, you know, if we had a culture that in, respected compliance and were outraged, as the public were, by what was going on in government departments, we wouldn't need legislation that becomes so minute and detailed. Um, legis the legislation being put forward has been brought in because it appears that decency <laughs> and doing the right thing was thrown to the side by some people for whatever reason. They just started to behave like that and nobody ever seemed to say stop it. And um, the sort of guardians of the system, the civil servants who are there as the, in many ways, as the, you know, the, the white knights, the ones who are more Caesar's wife above suspicion, and therefore actually supposed to say, look, this can't go on a minister. Do you know what your special advisor is doing? And we can't work with it. So that just didn't seem to happen. Things just snowballed out of control. So the difficulty is that perhaps to enforce proper respectable, decent behaviour within senior paid public sector staff, there has to be very detailed legislation. I, mean, I, I mentioned at the very end of my, my paper to you that I'm um, from a tax background. I'm an accountant in my day job, and I used to be a tax inspector, so I am soaked in the minute eye of tax legislation, which is all written because somebody came up with a loophole. And every time some, and I'm not one of them, smart aleck tax consultants thinks of a way of getting past the law, that the government then has to issue loads more statute to try and stop it. And that's so every time the tax law, they try and simplify it, it actually ends up longer because people think of more ways of getting around things. And I think this is where this has come from, mm -hmm. an attempt to try and introduce um, clear standards that everybody would expect people to, to follow, but just more honoured in the breach but, and the observance. And that, but, I think, is a difficulty. Would you not agree that the new codes are clear standards? It is about culture. It's not often about the codes. It's about the behaviour. Yes. It's bad. But in terms of the um, proportionality and whistleblowing, where... Yeah, well, I mean, the whistleblowing is, is a problem. If I understand it correctly, and please tell me if I've got picked this up wrong, the issue is the fear that a, that a special advisor releases information because they need, they feel it needs to go into the public domain for good reason. And what happens if the legislation then catches them? But presumably, a public interest defence, or whatever the appropriate phraseology would be, will get past that. Hmm. And I have to say, having seen some of the suggestions of a, senior, a junior civil servant who won't mind, we will go through all these levels and that'll be fine and make them happy about whistleblowing. What I've seen of how things operate, civil servants will still be very, very nervous, whatever the legislation says, mm. and however much protection is put in formally. Um, and whistleblowing, if you are a relatively junior cler clerical member of staff, you will not want to go, as is suggested, to the next one up in the management scheme because all that will happen is that things will, may well not go well, or you will fear that things will not go well, and so on and so on. So one wouldn't want to do anything that would put people off having an opportunity to go out and to the public domain. It is a shame if it has to be the media, which I gather the, um, the individual in the RHI think said she wished she'd just gone to the media because she fell into the morass that can be the civil service response to something difficult. I don't have straight answers to it. Um, I say it is unfortunate that we seem to be living in a political culture where legislation like this needs to be drafted. You know, you should just do the right thing. Tell the truth and shame the devil, Granny said, and I think that's it, you know. Uh, just oh, want to yeah. make one point before I go. Uh, you were talking about 93,000. Even the numerations have 
completely changed mm. the here in front of me, up to 54,000, 55 to 69, 70, 85, so it's not, right, not 93. Going up, so these Five. codes have been updated, and I don't think there are, I don't have the evidence, there are too many on the 85, I think they're on the middle code. Four. So these have been updated and strengthened, and, and from what we are hearing from the uh, permanent secretary of this committee is that uh, she is keeping a good eye on it, and there seems to be better open and cultural change. You know. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Just no problem. Pat. Thanks, John and Spawn. Thanks very much for just coming today. Um, just looking at as we try to look at the bill as it's going in. How can we really try to get this? To make it as strong as we possibly can, and make the code mandatory. All right. So, as, uh, the more I hear, the more I'm in favour of the legislative side of it in order to bring this down w with the bill. Uh, it seems. Are you of that same thinking? I, I am. Yes. Um, because my experience has been that codes that are there for guidance and to be applied, unfortunately, don't. Mm -hmm. Time is spent working out how to get round them. Um, I mean, an example which I once upset the head of the civil service terribly with was a phone call we had in my office where somebody rang up and said, we know who we want to appoint, now how do we get round that code? That's enough for me, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it, Lisa. Yeah, so fuck your own, uh, shocking you faster. You're very welcome here today too. Uh, and just a couple of points I'd like to just uh, relate to. Uh, much of the discussion there actually uh, was on the round uh, appointment in itself, uh, and I don't really think an appointment as such it requires legislation. Um, and that when one talks about what say and what was happening with the SPADs uh, in terms of the, their roles, uh, in particular in the RHI inquiry and so on, uh, it wasn't as a result of their appointment. Uh, it was, as you have confirmed yourself, and I totally agree with you on this one. Uh, a culture, uh, a culture, and particularly even we'll say within a particular party, we'll say that where that seemed to be the name of the game, uh, that uh, an irrespective of whether you have a code of practice or you legislate for it, if that culture persists, you're dealing with exactly the same problem. So that is what has to change. Uh, and in fact, if anything, in one respect, uh, you confirm that as well too, uh, in your role as a tax officer, uh, that. Uh, immediately you would have seen that when legislation was passed that established a particular practice, we'll say, uh -huh. in taxation, you had many a tax accountant or otherwise looking at ways to, to circumvent it. Uh, that was a culture. Uh -huh. uh, and that and its circumvention, it also then required additional legislation. Uh -huh. So it was like a never-ending yes. sort of process in a sense. So, in fact, in one way, um, a code of conduct as opposed to legislative practice, one can be as good as the other. And in particular, if that culture pertains, then it undermines both of them. Uh, and it is the culture that has to be addressed. And I'd like to think anyway, that in the case of uh, the north of Ireland here, uh, with the re-establishment uh, of government, uh, given the experience that we had when this house was, closed, that they've recalibrated, they've reset their, their modes of practice, and hopefully that culture won't exist and won't continue to exist. So again, to, uh, there's always that doubt that would remain there. Um, or Margaret. I, you mentioned about the, the appointments. I mean, the, the re reason I'm talking about that is that is my particular expertise and, and experience with appointments. And it was one of the things that Sir Patrick brought up that appointments were not following the, recognize, the, uh, the code of practice at the time even, and I mean the ministers were quite open about that, that and they, you know, they just that that was how it was done, and, and the civil servants were accepting that that was how it was done, even though the permanent secretaries certainly knew better and should have been keeping notes of how things were being done, but then we found they didn't keep notes of anything. Um, so that, so that, that's where, and I think that it, it's a flow chart, it, you know, this is the person who's put there and then this is how they behave. So we start with how, how do you find the individual? How does he get, or she get the job? And then, so that, that's part of where the, the appointment issue comes from. It's important that that's very clear. And then the behavior afterwards. 
there is no answer to this problem of legislating to try and change. And, and do, when does one take the risk? I mean, within the taxation world, I would say, in 30 years, nobody's ever come to me and offered to pay more tax. <laughs> um, you know, taxation is something that if we just left it to be voluntary, things just wouldn't happen. Um, and that's, you know, people understand why they pay tax, what it does, what it provides for them within society, but still, it's very hard to write the check to HMRC or have it taken out of your monthly salary. So it is a real issue. And, and I think the things have got so bad that the assembly has to be seen to do something. I know and this is something. I know there's always that potential as well. But you know, can we risk another five years, maybe, of things going wrong again? After which the public will just say, a plague in all your houses, I fear. That, that's where I think you have to come and do something and see what happens from there. And maybe a few years with this, then things could be rolled back a bit. But unfortunately, at this stage, I think legislation is your only hope. But I understand the, the dangers of it and the problems of it. Well, I just make the point that whenever you say that no one comes to the tax accountant looking to pay less tax, what? but it's not the people. Uh, that are coming to the tax accountant as the culture within tax accountancy in itself. And I, and I say that at my own son as a tax accountant in another jurisdiction. Uh, uh, but that, uh, so, as, uh, again, I come back to this very point. As the culture is the important issue. Well, I used to sit on the other side of the desk as well, and nobody ever wanted to come to see me when I was a tax inspector. <laughs> Oddly enough. <laughs> sure that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Melissa. Um, and I think, just before we finish, it, I'm sure it sums up when you're talking about tax. When we're talking about the difference between avoidance and evasion, yes. and speaking as somebody whose um, spouse uh, worked for a very large member of the P5, and I could never work out what the difference between avoidance and evasion was. The, way the last it, Chancellor couldn't either. Mm -hmm, exactly. <laughs> but this really comes down to the avoidance bit, where we're looking at the code, but the evasion bit when we're looking at legislation because we've reached the point where we do that. So but yes. thank you very much indeed, Felicity, for your okay. evidence. And thank you very much indeed for coming on such a warm day as well. Do we have any, if we have any, any follow up questions, can we send them to you oh, and ask you to start you a response on them? Me. Yes, sir, play at all. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you very much. It's been, it's been a pleasure to see you again. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much thank indeed. Thank you. Yes, I'd be glad to get out of this rather warm room. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. And on that note, sure. allow me to. Sorry, go ahead, Jim. I was just going to say, I think Mrs. Houston threw up a whole new area about whether or not the public appointment process yes. is adequate. Mm -hmm. Now, she confesses she may be a bit out of date. So I would have thought we should ask the research people to look at her evidence and if there is any update, let's say, is there any change in the budget arrangements yeah. for, for that office? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, find out, uh, does all, all that she says still stand? Yeah. And if it does, I would have thought this committee might want to look I think at bringing probably. forward an amendment to encapsulate some of that. Yeah, because that was, them, I mean, this committee should be talking into the bill staff. So generally, generally speaking, that was an, you know, from the evidence that was being presented today. But that uh, discussion, particularly around the public appointments process yeah. and the independence of the public appointments process, yeah. That speaks to the whole openness and transparency and the yeah. governance aspect and the functioning of, of what, and functioning of government, which we're we're trying to consider. If we're can, one, one get, how do you get around the culture? That was one of our lines. I mean, that was the first thing before yeah, the appointment. The, yeah. Yeah. So that is valid. Yeah. Um, in that case, then can we have agreement to ask Reyes to look at what she said? Yeah. We content. Agreed. Yeah. So, what are we asking for here? We're asking Reyes to look at the evidence that was given by Felicity Houston today yeah. on the issues of around public appointments, the public, public appointments, but also on budget yeah. and independence. The whole office of the, oh, the office of it. Office, yeah. 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 That'll be a separate yeah. body of work uh, in every respect uh, from, say, what this, we have been considering here today, her evidence in relation to uh, Mr. Alistair's bill. Yes, but my bill is so drafted that if we identify an issue that requires attention to improve the functioning of government, even though it's a new issue, such as this, this committee could adopt an amendment 
to look they specifically would at that. propose to deal specifically with that issue, to the add on to the bill. Minister, the, the question is not whether we're adding on to the bill. The question is, is what she said. We need to research what she said, whether it's still yeah. valid. And I, think, and I think that is germane to what our discussion is. Yeah, the only thing that concerns me in one respect is that, uh, and I can totally appreciate that, uh, as nearly like it's a standalone issue in a sense, rather than just been something that where we continue to roll on and roll on and roll on and get additions after additions after additions. You know. yeah. It reminds me of, we'll say, very often in a council meeting on the AOB, uh, as soon as one person raises an issue, it triggers off in someone else's mind another issue that I have known for many years sitting in the select vestry that as soon as we get to AOB, the meeting goes on for another three hours. Yeah. I've known that from better experience. Yeah. But, well, but I think the question here is raised specifically look at the issues that she's raised. I think that's yeah. probably yeah. important. Could, could I ask the clerk, is there any way of accelerating the Hansard and that portion of her evidence for raise? Because it seems to be taking about two weeks for the Hansard to appear. It is usually two weeks. I can, I can see what we do, but I mean they are very, very busy yeah. at the minute. They are as understaffed as anybody else. But what what I can do is flag it up with race so that they can listen again. They can listen. Oh yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are we can? Anyway, also, so what Felicity said today, she did say that it's maybe not up to date. Up to date. So I think that's why we need race to look at it. Is see what's relevant today mm -hmm. and what weaknesses are today. Mm -hmm. uh, even Absolutely. around the appointments and the policy, um, yeah. she did say about, you know, why do you keep putting five years' experience on a board onto? So I think there's parameters mm -hmm. there that could be broken down. Mm -hmm. But I do know there, there is the code that the office now operates to the her office is a 2016 code. So obviously it came after sh she did. Mm -hmm. So it may be some of the issues are covered, but I'd just like to know. Yeah. Okay. If we're, if we're content. Thank you. I'm moving on to number eight. Number eight, you'd be glad to know chairperson's business. There is no chairperson's business at present. Moving on to item number nine, correspondence. Uh, item department regarding transposition of three articles contained in the EU Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, page 37. Anybody happy to note? Noted. Uh, from the Department regarding the Rates Coronavirus Emergency Relief Regulations, page 39. Members, have we any comments? And then I'd like to seek your agreement. The Committee is content with the proposal to reflect the four months rate holiday in the regulations when they come back to the Committee. I think we are. Yes. Yeah. Uh, seek agreement to note the information relating to the back in business scheme. Uh, are we content to do that? Noted. Yeah. Uh, departmental response regarding budget number two, Bell background paper, page 41. Do we have any questions? Sorry. Uh, if you've got an agreement, can we forward the departmental response regarding budget number two, Bell, to the committees for health and infrastructure? Are we content? Um, departmental response regarding disciplinary processes arising from the RHI inquiry, page 43. Jim, Paul, anything? Go on, uh, well, I think they've been very coy with us. I think they could have told us how many investigations there are, what ranks they're at. And the last paragraph, which says current employees who are subject to disciplinary matters arising from the RHI report will be invited to a disciplinary hearing, whether they're due to retire over the next couple of months or not. What well, that doesn't answer, and to refer you back to the answer that I got from the minister, was that once they leave, there's no consequence for them. So, you know, does that mean they can be subject to disciplinary matters, which then you're retiring on the 31st of August, the 31st of August, cut <coughs> off, over, end of? That paragraph doesn't really answer that. I do think they could have told us a bit, a bit more. Yeah, I suppose I would add to that, you know, they, that middle paragraph where they talk about at the end of the process, the civil service will report on the outcome. Again, no timeline, no, no, uh, it doesn't seem to be any pressure there being applied with regards to speedy and hasty uh, procedures uh, to try and get to the end of this uh, process. And then also the, the, the bigger issue about the RHI inquiry itself and, and what committees are picking up what points and recommendations 
this letter, of course, deals with the disciplinary process within the civil service, but there's a wider piece of work to be done on the RHI inquiry itself. Uh, and you know we need to see movement on that. There was to be a committee set up. Again, we've asked questions around that. I think it's something we need to keep on the boil. Like if there's an external report which has been concluded, sure we were entitled to know has it recommended any discipline? Um, how many people? What rank ranks are they? I think we're entitled to know those basics. Um, from my perspective, when I read that, uh, raised quite a few concerns to me, because it didn't indicate the level of the people who were under investigation, uh, what procedures had been conducted, who was conducting the procedures, um, and we've had an example here of um, we know that very many, quite a few senior civil servants will be shortly returning in the summer. Mm -hmm. Are they about to find themselves on quango boards very shortly? Mm. Bearing in mind, they could be indeed some of the people who, if we knew what the details were at the RHI report, yeah. they were the very ones who would be in a uh, who would have been uh, recommended for disciplinary action, which of course we don't know about. So I think, uh, generally, on behalf of the com uh, and I'll take your response from the rest of the committee, but I think that's quite an unsatisfactory response, and I would uh, seek. Um, your approval for us to write back to them for us okay. some more specific details. And obviously, they don't have to give us the names yeah. of the individuals, but they can give us the roles, the grades. Yeah. And also, uh, if there's any people who would be likely to be investigated who are due to retire shortly. Yeah. Because if uh, there's a guillotine on everybody who walks out the door of the civil service who's not going to be investigated for something that potentially could have cost a taxpayer half a billion quid. I think that should be a matter of concern for everybody in this committee, and indeed everybody in Northern Ireland. Are we content? Great. Thank you. Uh, departmental response to the closure of land registry. Um, I think it was Jim Wells was asking the question on that one. Anybody like to make a response to that? Well, they're promising us from next Monday it's yeah. back to business. Yeah. Are we um, happy to uh, forward that response to the Law Society? Yeah. Great. Uh, from the owner of a small business regarding issues arising from the hardship fund, I'd like to seek your on page 46. I'd like to your agreement to write to the committee for the economy, suggesting that they investigate the changes of the hardship fund after the criteria have been published. Are we content? Uh, I spoke with the gentleman that wrote that letter into us, and it's again, it's one of those. It's through a the gap. Trader. Is that pardon? Yeah. yeah, through the gaps one. Yeah. Uh, oh, you can hear me all right. Yes. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And. Uh, Look, it's, it, it, there's a lot of complex issues that, that, that are there, and he's not the only one. There's lots of other people. Our, our offices, they've all contacted us that have slipped through and fell through the net that's in that. I think what he's asking to do is a big ask. I think that he's already approached the MP, Sir Geoffrey uh, Donaldson, in order to try and see can that be ratified uh, through through, through Parliament, but um, I, I do think that we should send it at least to, to the Economy Minister, uh, you know, and see if there's some way. It's, it's a difficult one, uh, without getting or speaking on it now that it's there for us to lead, but I mean, it, it'd be a very difficult one in order to try and get a solution out of it. But really, what he's asking there for is like a bond. Okay, so. I think that uh, if we, we pass that and ask that question and see what, what they come back with. If, are you in agreement with that, Chair? Mm. Yeah, well, I think um, sort of the, the agreement, uh, sort of Jim has quite helpfully put some notes here about for the Committee for the Economy suggesting they investigate the changes to the hardship fund after the criteria has been yeah. published. That's one piece of work. To a strong understanding that the Minister of Finance can only take action which is a fully costed proposition from the relevant minister, which is the case because yes. we need to know what the economy are doing. And to advise the individual that the committee has also asked the Committee for the Economy to investigate changes to the hardship fund after the criteria has been published. So you know, we need to say, here's the situation. We're going to pass it on to the Department of Economy to look at and get the issues from that and then respond to that as, as it comes through, if you're content with that. Yeah. Are you content? Okay. Chair, and I can also confirm I spoke to the clerk of the Committee for the Economy, and that was to be considered by that committee at today's meeting as well. They also got the oh, correspondence. Good. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Jim. Uh, can I seek agreement to note the remaining items of correspondence? Great. Mm -hmm. 
Great. If we move to the Forward Work Programme, inform members the updated Forward Work Programme to July 2020 is at page uh, 81. I would like to remind members that the committee has previously indicated that it was content to receive oral evidence from the Perm Secretary in relation to the departmental issues uh, paper and first day brief in closed session. This is the point when you say something, Deputy. Um, I, I, pause was for effect. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, again, I really am not in the mind to go in any sort of way to private discussion on these issues. We need to make sure that we, as a scrutiny committee, are an exemplar of transparency. Uh, given, <laughs> given the attitude of the Department over the last number of weeks, given the fact that withholding emails from us that we know exist and the, and the, and, and the silly excuse for not giving them to us, uh, I'm not in the mood and the mindset to allow this committee to be lowered to the standard of the Department at this present time, and I think we have to be as transparent as we possibly can. There's no reason why the Permanent Secretary can't give this committee a briefing in open session transparent and if there's anything of sensitivity around that then we could afford a small portion of time to go into closed session but oh. we need to make sure that this committee is as transparent as possible oh. no, I was just uh, referring back to the, the member uh, transparency etc etc I think that, and he was talking about the emails, and I think I myself from yesterday was that the minister said that uh, any genuine request um, he would look at it, and mm -hmm. certainly there was a response. People may not have been happy here with it, there was a response, um, and he did say at the end of it he would deal with it, and um, I think transparency and everything is fine. And, Listen to the member yesterday going on and on and on about transparency. He must be a decent convert to it. But um, he said he would address that. Uh, in relation to uh, next week, I think there are issues around this. If there's issues of sensitivity, whether they're legal or uh, whatever, I think that they should be protected. Uh, and therefore, uh, if they're, it's fine, they're coming here to. Uh, give a briefing, and we should accept that. And if there are other um, sensitivities, we should understand that. Well, I agree with Paul. We should. The default position should be public. If they can convince us during that session that there's something that should be in private, then okay. But the default position should not be private meetings. Mm -hmm. okay. I, just to the chair, um, well, I agree with Sean. Uh, in fact, whenever uh, it was suggested that if something arises that should be private, then we take a decision. I remember one time talking to a man, and he was elusive brethren, and um, our exclusive brethren. I used to say uh, different words there because of a situation that existed at the time. They didn't allow television in their house, and uh, he explained to me why. And I said to him, "Well, but you know, if something came on." I said, you can get up and turn it off, but then he says it's too late. And the same would apply in this situation as well, too. I think it's putting the cart before the horse here. What one should do is that they should accommodate uh, the meeting in private, and the event of it being uh, information that can go public, then it can go public. But to address the other way around, it's a contradict. Okay. Ah. I... Uh, uh, if we, I believe that we should be open and transparent, Chair. That's what I'm here for, and that's what the sort of, I want this place to have like a contract with the general public that, that we're honest and transparent. Gemma. I think I heard Gemma leave. Uh, oh, all right. Disconnect mm -hmm. something. <laughs> OK. OK, then, then team, on the, on the basis that, um, sort of having heard the views that we're here as well, Look, I think it's important that the Permanent Secretary has the opportunity, if there are specific areas she wants to discuss uh, in closed session. 
I think we should facilitate that. However, I think the session should be open until that has been indicated that there are particular areas that you would wish to discuss. And there may, there may be issues that I think we need to consider that if the Permanent Secretary says I would wish those to be in closed session, I think we, as a consideration to the Permanent Secretary, would uh, do that. So I suggest we go back to the uh, I will say that we we'll go back to the Permanent Secretary. I say it will be an open session until you, you can indicate to us beforehand the areas that you wish us to be in sort of a uh, closed session. And I think that answers, I think that answers both the, cons the concerns and the consensus of the people here in the committee. Yeah, I think that's a good job compromise, Chair. And I think that knowing the Permanent Secretary, Sue Gray, she will want to try and recover some ground here mm -hmm. uh, for her department. Is it her name's on that department as much as anyone, and you know she's a very experienced lady, so she should be able to handle this okay. Okay, sure. uh, sir. I, I just want the member to recover some ground from what, you know, concealments. He's uh, making general uh, sweeping statements here that the department is at such a low ebb it needs to regain ground. I don't know what the department has been going through huge uh, crisis here of a pandemic, dealing with people out on the street, the hardship funds, people in need, and all of that, that none of us have ever seen unprecedented. And he's saying that the department needs to retrieve itself, that it has some integrity or credibility. I don't know what he's talking about. Thank you, Sean. Your comments are noted. Uh, uh, sorry, just chair again too. Uh, I'd like to go back on that as well too, and I just find it. Uh, uh, I'm shocked actually at the total lack of confidence this committee seems to have, uh, and anyone that makes presentation or representation to us, that whenever they would ask, we'll say for our cooperation with them, that quite clearly we're not prepared to give it at all, uh, and uh, to imply that, uh, that in some way that whenever that request was made. That it's uh, in order to uh, concealment was the word I think I heard coming from behind me here, uh, you know, as opposed to transparency or openness or the likes of it. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm shocked at that. Uh, I'm just totally absolutely shocked at the complete lack of, um, of uh, understanding on, on the members of this committee. Okay, uh, Melissa, you're That's shocked. Uh, you're shocked. Uh, just, uh, I mean, uh, just, I, I, just, sorry, sorry. sorry, just, just, uh, um, uh, oh, sorry, Melissa, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and talking about shocked, Melissa, I have an apology to make. Uh, I missed out an item on item seven on the agenda, which is on financial scrutiny consideration of options. And I must draw your attention to the following papers relating to this agenda item. It's the Clark briefing paper on page 27. Do you have any comment on that? I apologise profusely, uh, members of the committee. I sort of missed that when I was uh, going through. I thank you, Jim, for drawing that to my attention. And if you don't have any comments, I would like your seek, seek your agreement to proceed with the suggested actions identified in the clerk's paper. Please. Are we content? Yep. Okay. Thank you very much, Martin. Sorry for that. Uh, so, no, I, I, I don't. I, I, I don't want anyone to think in any way that, that from me or my point of view, that that's some sort of witch hunt. I mean, it was only a week or two ago we we wrote a letter in order to our finance minister and congratulate them on the way that those loans were passed out, and I said that in the chamber as well. But look, we, it has to be fair, and it has to be honest, and it has to look like that to the general public. And I mean, there's no, there's no, it's so easy to come in, but it's private. We go into private, that's already agreed with us. And we, you know, so I don't think that we need to be wasting all of this time or, or trying to say there's some sort of a, a witch hunt. There's not for me. And I don't think there is, uh, personally. Let's get it out, get it there, on the open, and clear the deck and move on. Because we have far more important things to be doing here than chasing our tail for a bit of paper. OK, thank you very much indeed, uh, Pat, for that. I'd uh, just like your agreement for Kent content for the forward work programme, subject to the inclusion of the oral evidence session from the Department of Finance Division in your monitoring on the 17th of June. Are we content with the usual provisos? Thank you. Uh, any other business? Go on, Melissa. Go on, go on, go on. <laughs> <It'll be. laughs> uh, can I, can I, I, it's been on my mind for a number of weeks. Uh, what I've noticed in the constituency role, and I'm sure you guys have felt it too, seen it too, is the 
stellar performance of LPS, and in particular Ian Snowden, the Chief Executive, in the way they have been able to address concerns by elected members when we have approached them on the 10,000k grant. The way they have administered that grant is exceptional, and the way they have addressed some of our concerns. I, I, I have sent emails to Ian Snowden and have received an email back within minutes. It is extraordinary. Uh, the system that they had in play. Now, there's still outstanding payments, of course, but the amount of payments that they did administer in the rate of knots that they did and at the time scale of which they did is exceptional. And I know that we have congratulated the Minister on his decision, on the rates decision, but I think on the actual administrating of the 10K grant, irrespective of the policies and who's left in and who's left out, the administration of that and getting that out, and the response that MLAs were able to get from Ian Snowden, Chief Executive himself, is exceptional, and I think we should, uh, if we can't write, we should certainly put it on record for uh, appreciation for all his efforts. Oh. Sure. Um, I, I probably didn't write to himself, but I did write to a, a very high official, his name was Tony Lockwell, and every time, I have to agree with you, and these, they were working from home. It's a brand new system set in place, and they went out of their way in order to help those most difficult of cases, even those that were waiting to get a property number. They were able to come back and, yeah. and do whatever way they possibly can. So I, I would be in agreement with the member. I would be in agreement with Paul as well. He said that. A letter of thanks from the committee. Yeah, if that's in order. Yeah. If we're content. Yep. Yeah. Happy. Any 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 other AOB? <laughs> Okay, uh, team, uh, next Wednesday, 10th of June, 2.30, and here, please. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Programme Sound. <laughs>